In this next interview, Lisa Peterson. She is the host of The Mindful Millionaire. And if there's one thing I love, it's women teaching other women about how to be great with money. So definitely check this out. Lisa, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Christy. So to start off, tell me about yourself and your business. So I run a company called Wealth Clinic. And what we do is we help people who are interested in the inner journey and how that plays out in the business that they create. So creating more of a passion fueled business. So making money, doing things they love, doing things that are inspiring to themselves and that make a better, make the world a better place. Uh, well, now I understand um, a good friend of ours just said, you're going to work with Lisa. And now I understand why. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, about you and how you got started on doing this for others. So my career has been focused in the money business. I got my MBA in the early 90s and ended up becoming a financial advisor, uh, working my way into that in many different jobs in the financial services business. And in 2014, actually at the end of 2013, I had been practicing meditation and mindfulness practices and teaching people meditation. And I kept that completely separate up until a very pivotal thing happened in my life at the end of 2013. And I realized that I couldn't keep these worlds separate. I wanted to bring this discovery of money and, and what happens inside of us with money into the work that I do. And being a financial advisor, people weren't really interested in having that conversation. So I ended up realizing I needed to walk away from being a financial advisor and start teaching people about their relationship with money. I love this discussion. So let's get into what you believe money is and how it ties into our inner world and, and, and how you discovered it. What, what is going on? <laughs> yeah, the, the fact that I worked with people and their money for, you know, almost 30 years now it made me curious because whenever I worked with people, even way back when I first got my, my first job out of college, I worked for State Farm Insurance. And it was really funny because I was being able to give people money to fix their houses and do repairs and things like that. And the, I was pretty young at the time. And the minute I pulled out the checkbook, people would completely change their demeanor towards me. Like I had power now because I had the ability to write a check. And I was kind of shocked because they would be a bit demeaning to me. I was young, are you gonna be able to help me with this? And then I pull out the checkbook and they were different. And I was like, what is it about money that causes people to change? And fast forward when I was a financial advisor, I got really curious about asking more questions of what was happening for people. And I would ask my clients to come meet me in a coffee shop or have a discussion offline, not in our regular you know, way that I helped them invest their money, but more about the personal aspects of money. And these conversations, they might've started out like, oh, let's spend 30 minutes. And then two or three or four hours later, after many tears, people had no idea that there was this relationship that they had just like, a relationship with their spouse or a relationship with their child, they also had a relationship with, with money and they weren't really happy about that relationship. And, and it opened up a lot of doors for people to start making changes in their lives. And after I saw that happen, I was like, I want more of this. Like there's something here that no one's talking about that I think could really help people live more free lives with greater ability to create what they really wanted. So let's say we were one of those people who you sat down. How would you get into us? How would we start that discussion of, of uncovering all of this? Yeah, the first question typically that I like to ask is, tell me, you know, your earliest memory of money. And that has a way of bringing us back to our childhood. And, you know, some folks are like, oh, when my dad gave me some money and I bought an ice cream cone, you know, it, it, it isn't charged with a lot of energy. But many people, myself included, 
when we think back about our earliest memories, I had a really difficult time growing up because my parents fought about money all the time. So my first memory was my parents fighting and also expressing fear that they wouldn't be able to pay the bills or that we were gonna lose the house or a car. And it caused me to go into this hyper alert from a very, very young age that isn't really healthy. And yet what I found was a lot of people have unhealthy memories that bring up a lot of trauma and, and fear. So the, the conversation is all about what can you remember? What are those, what are the beliefs perhaps that your parents had about money and how might you be affected by those beliefs even you know many years later? So once you start having this conversation and, and you discover some of the things we have that aren't healthy, what do, you, what do you do about that? The first thing that we have to realize is awareness is everything. So for many of us, we don't know that these things are affecting us, that these memories or these feelings or these beliefs, we don't realize how much of an impact they're having. And the minute we pay attention to it, we've already begun to heal is the way I look at it. Like we are rewiring the connections. We're starting to question the beliefs. And I'll give you a quick example. Even though I was doing this work and I've been helping people for years and, and a little bit of my story is I made money really important to my, to my whole self-worth and my self-identity when I was really young. And by the time I was in my mid thirties, I had become a self-made millionaire. And then fast forward, maybe six, seven years later, my son and I are in line at the grocery store and he goes to ask me to buy a candy bar. And I had already been studying all of this. And my first response to him was, we can't afford, we can't afford it. And my son being the wise cracking kid that he is looked at me and said, mom, you just bought a brand new car and you can't afford to buy this candy bar. And I was mortified, but that was the thing that my mom would say when I was at the grocery store, when I was a kid. And I didn't realize that that, that was something I was still doing to my kids. And so just in that moment, I was like, I don't want to live this way anymore. And I don't want to teach my child the same thing that I learned from my family. So it's not like we have to have a big thing happen. We already begin it just by learning about what's happening. I'd love to hear your story. Let's, let's hear about how you started and, and what happened in your life with money. So like I said, my parents really were not good with money. And I say they, they had decent jobs. They hadn't gone to college. So my mom was a hairdresser. My dad was a truck dispatcher. But the problem is, is neither of them had ever learned how to manage money. So when money came in, they would spend more than they had. And this is the early 70s, you know, credit was taking off and they didn't know how to manage credit. So they were always in trouble, always trying to catch up. And so what happened was as soon as I figured out that the problem was money, I was like, I'm going to have a lot of money and then all my problems are going to go away. And sure enough, I started working when I was eight years old. I started a business selling things door to door and I pretty much made money and have made money ever since. Like I am just very scrappy and then I would always find a job or always find an opportunity. But when I finished college, it's interesting, my parents were very creative and I had studied clothing design as an undergrad in college because I really wanted to be in a creative position. But when I got out of school and started working in the design business, I realized that I was making less money than when I had been in college, like bartending and cocktailing. And I immediately realized that I you know, had a belief that that I hadn't paid much attention to, which was you can't make money in a creative position. And so I quit my job. I went back to school to get an MBA, which is so weird. Like I hated math, but it was it was like, I need money and I'm going to do whatever it takes to get it. And so that began the career and focusing in the money business. OK, so now how do you work with clients someone comes to you and they want to grow their finances or business T talk to me about how you talked about your your passion i started my business around the relationship with money and ended up writing a book about it and what i continued were those conversations of asking people 
you know, what's happening underneath, what's happening in how you think about money, how do you spend money, and how do you feel about that? And what I learned was when we open the feeling sense, most of us have shut that down. How we feel about money isn't so much the thing we're thinking about, it's how we think about it. And what I started to discover and what I help people do now is separate the way that we're focused from a scarcity perspective and a lack based kind of attitude to life versus an abundant attitude. And so when you get into those stories that people are holding on to from the past and, and you start to, you know, look at them and understand that, that we're, we're thinking there isn't enough. I'm not enough. There's not enough to go around. And until we start to question the belief system underneath it, the money doesn't change. Like it's really tough to change our patterns with money. Like if many people have problems with debt and they, they think, well, I know how to get out of debt. I know what I could do differently, but yet they struggle with changing the behavior. And so what I do through the discovery of someone's relationship with money is I help them rewire the way that they are feeling about money. Because if they can rewire that feeling, they can go on to make better choices and decisions. And, and you know, there's also research about scarcity, which is very interesting. Uh, there, there's a book written about it, Harvard, Princeton researchers, but what they found is when we're consumed by not enough, so not enough money, not enough resources, not being good enough, we uh, end up having a, a, a loss in IQ of up to 13 points. So it's like losing a full night's sleep. And so imagine if you're stressed about not enough, not enough, it's like you're getting stupider and stupider, sadly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we also do this thing called tunneling, where instead of seeing all the possibilities, we only see one, maybe two options, and probably those aren't the best options. So my goal is to help people realize where scarcity has caused them to be trapped in a cycle. And if we can get them to understand that there's another possibility and that they don't have to live from those memories of the past, they begin to change their behaviors. And it's, it's not quite as simple as that, but that's what I do. <laughs> I love that description and also the statistics of, of what scarcity does for you. That's so powerful. So how, give us some advice on, okay, so we're feeling this, we're feeling stressed out, we're feeling scarcity, we're feeling the constriction on all of it. How do we move into abundance and, and to knowing that? So a lot of the work that I teach people is, is oriented to mindfulness and a realization that until we slow down and we become more aware of who we are and the truth of our being it's really tough to change the patterns like we many of us have a deflated sense of who we really are in the world like i'm, I'm constantly blown away like you could meet billionaires and have a deep dive conversation and before you know it you're like they actually are trying to prove to the world that they're, you know, something big, powerful, you name it. And the same thing goes with someone who has no money. Like it doesn't even matter how much money someone has. But what I've realized is until we can return back to the relationship that we have with ourselves. And you asked me a good question earlier. You said, what is money? And what I've come to realize, you know, over the journey is that money is merely a tool and it is definitely not a yardstick for our value as a human being. And yet a lot of people in this society that we live in says that it is like a measuring stick. And so what I've what I've seen is that until you let go of that idea that money is going to be the thing that proves your value you're kind of a sunk goose if you will like you're always going to come back to not feeling good enough and so the journey is in is is about discovering who you really are not from the external but from the internal experience to know the truth of yourself and you know that's probably why people talk about my work not being instant gratification because it, it, it can't be you know you might have 30 40 50 years of believing one thing and now you're changing it 
But what I have seen is that the minute people hear the truth of themselves and they hang out with someone who is living in that state all the time, it it rubs off because it's the truth of who we are. It's like, I don't have to teach somebody who they are. But what the problem is, is we don't surround ourselves with people who believe that for themselves. And so we're like, well, where is it? I I'm looking in for money. I'm looking for success. I'm looking for this. And none of those places will ultimately bring what we're seeking. Well, you just said why I'm so passionate about the series. And it's crazy. I'm in this chair and I get to see all of you and learn from all of you and, and almost be around that energy. And I remember when um, it was one of the earliest interviews and she said, it is so easy to be so rich. And I was like, what is she talking about? Like, this is new. And it's just being around this energy of, yes, you step into who you are and it, it starts to become yours as well. So thank you for saying like that. That's why we're doing this show. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful. Will, will you walk us through, I, I feel like you have a mindfulness or there's some short little practice that can give um, someone watching a taste of what you're talking about, being mindful around your abundance. Yeah. So one of the things that we could do in this moment is taking a few big, nice, deep breaths through our belly, into our belly and feeling the grounding that happens as we expand the belly. Exhale, can you know shrink the belly and fill it up again. And noticing even how it feels in this moment to become aware of your body perhaps in a new way, wiggling your fingers and toes, but inviting yourself to come home into your body. And noticing how you can let go of the thoughts of lack and perhaps even mounting it on the breath when you're breathing out you're letting go of lack and limitation. And you can go as deep as you want to go with that. And when you breathe in, you're breathing in this light, love, abundance, and feeling that expansive nature. And again, letting go of lack and limitation. and breathing in this sense of abundance and expansion and again letting go and when you breathe in this time notice the receiving that happens you're receiving the air from mother earth And when you breathe out, you're giving, giving it back. And just one more cycle, breathing in and breathing out. It really is that simple that, you know, I like to think of of giving and receiving as this cycle that we're engaged in all the time. Sadly, we've been taught this belief system, at least many people have, that it's better to give than to receive. But what's fascinating is imagine if we just did that exercise and all we did was breathe out and we never breathed in. Hmm. We wouldn't be around for very long. <laughs> And yet many people are cutting themselves off from the ability to receive. There's, there's belief systems that tell us that it's, it's evil to be rich or it's greedy to be rich or selfish to be rich. 
And yet that's not true. There, there's nothing out there that says that we can't take really, really good care of ourselves. And learning how to receive is something that I've learned over my time. Like I have been good at receiving throughout my life. I didn't know that's what I was good at. But when I look at how I was able to, to make so much money and keep so much money, I'm like, I'm pretty good at this. But what I also realized is a lot of people really, really struggle with receiving, whether it's asking to receive, you know, like I want this and then, and then accepting it, uh, not deflecting it. Or the minute it comes in, it's got to go somewhere else. And I feel like that's what my parents did. They would make money, but then they'd spend it as soon as they got it. They didn't feel comfortable sitting on money or having money in a bank account. But yet, if you want to have more money in your life, you've got to learn that balance between the two, the two actions, giving and receiving. That was beautiful. And when I hear you speak, it's money feels like a cycle, feels like nature, feels like it flows in and flows out. And then it takes that, you know, that the thought you were talking about, the thinking about money versus feeling about money. And it's really powerful, really, really wonderful. Thank you so much. Anything, I feel like there's one piece of wisdom in you that someone needs to hear. I had a time where I really struggled with receiving money, particularly when I started my company. And instead of working for someone else, now I was out there promoting, you know, myself. And that was a really big leap having left these big brands and you kind of show up and you can embody the brand rather than it being all about, you know, me. And I had a situation happen where I was trying to step into myself and, and I didn't know what was still holding me back. And if you've ever heard of work that I end up helping people with now, but it's it started with Carl Jung, it's called shadow work. And it's the aspects of ourselves that are hidden. And we all have them and they continue to come out, right? We become aware of them over the course of our life journey. But for me, one of the biggest things that I had to go through was a realization that when I was a child, because my parents were not good with money, I would hoard money and hide it in my room because if they they would come and say, can I borrow money? And I'd be like, nope, you can't borrow money. <laughs> well, they I got a reputation in my home for being selfish and greedy. And so it wasn't until I started my business that I was like, why is this so hard? That this, this belief came out that because I had been labeled as selfish and greedy when I was a child, I was thinking now that I was asking people to pay me in my job or in my business that I was starting, I, that came up and I couldn't be successful in business until I learned that, that this was just a story my family had told me. I had thought that it was true. And yet once I, I saw that that wasn't true, that, that I was actually being responsible and my parents weren't being responsible and that over time I was able to save all this money that allowed me to start my company. But this idea of dropping away this part of myself that I was so afraid if anybody found out that I was a greedy person, they wouldn't like me anymore, right? They wouldn't want to do business with me. And yet about a month after this happened, I went onto a stage and I told 800 women that I was a greedy person. And it was so funny because I'm like, the truth sets you free when you realize these things about yourself and you can tell, you know, your friends, your family, so forth. You, you always start with the people that aren't going to judge you, by the way. But when you do share your truth and you realize that these these silly stories that we're telling ourselves aren't true, other people... When I, when I shared that story that day, I thought, I wonder what they're going to think of me. And all these women ran to the back of the room to meet me because I couldn't believe that someone was willing to stay on a stage and say, I'm greedy and I'm okay with it. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so I'm sharing that because we all have these stories inside. And if that could help you unlock a story that maybe you're afraid that if people found out about it, they wouldn't like you or they wouldn't respect you. That was one of mine that, that changed my life in a positive way. I love it and being so authentic about it. So the series is called The Millionaire Within Her. What do you want to share with us about that? I want to share that your value 
is decided by you. Yes, we can do amazing things and help many people in the world, but at the end of the day, please don't look for permission to value yourself in the external world. The money comes as a result of you embodying who you really are in this life. You're on the journey to figure that out, but don't think that the external, including the money, is going to cause you to feel that sense of the truth that's gonna bring you the greatest happiness. Focus on finding your truth, loving yourself, having incredible compassion towards yourself every step of the way, no matter what decisions you've made that haven't worked out in the past, you are you are a millionaire. Like you have all that you need to create what you want. But the more you find the peace and the love and the the sense of joy inside of yourself, the easier it's going to be to create what you most want. Oh, that gives me chills. It makes me so happy. Thank you for sharing. Lisa, thank you so much for your time today. It's been such a pleasure. Uh, we can't wait to have you tell us more. And um, I already want to do more meditations and, and thoughts with you. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Wasn't that great? I hope you learned as much about finances and money mindset and being mindful around that. I know this is going to help you not only in your financial life, but your personal as well. Hi, my name is Karen Thomas. But guess what? That is not important. What's important is your success online. I can help you start a successful, thriving business online, no matter how many times you have failed. If you have a desire to win, you can. All you need is Wi-Fi, a laptop or desktop, and be able to follow simple directions. Reach out to me and I can show you exactly how.